So, my name is Zeal Akaraiwe. I run a financial advisory firm called Graham Black Advisory. We focus on risk management using derivatives. I also help people. <laughs> and I have a small philanthropic movement called the Angel Project that I spend some time on at least once or twice a month. Well, what's currently happening is very simple and complicated at the same time. The fear that's pervading our entire consciousness. Fear is a very unhealthy emotion to hold. And it's, it's best described from the perspective of hope. Hope or faith, as many people prefer, is exactly the same thing as fear in terms of its outcomes, in terms of its response, in terms of what it produces. They're exactly the same thing. The same way scent and odor are exactly the same thing. They are smells. It's just that one is used positively and the other is used negatively. Fear and faith are exactly the same thing. One is used positively and the other is used negatively. Both of them are belief systems. And whatever you believe tends to happen. And so that's why in the religious circles, you are told to believe certain things if you want them to happen. The other side of the same coin, it's not a different thing, is if you fear something, if your belief system is rooted in something, it will happen. If it's a positive thing, you call it faith. If it is a negative thing, you call it fear. Our body responds physically to those patterns of belief. So for example, there is something called the HPT axis in the body, the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis that controls your response to stress. And one of the first things it does when it's activated is that it shuts down your immune system because your immune system uses a lot of energy. And so when your stress signals are triggered, you have the flight or fight response. Whether you're going to stay and fight or you're going to run away, what you, your body then does is to pump an obscene amount of adrenaline into the system. It's not responding to what is happening. It's responding to what you're thinking. And so once it does that, in order to conserve energy, it shuts down your immune system, which is why when you are in a prolonged state of stress, you fall sick and you cannot predict what sickness because what has happened is your body, biologically and chemically, has shut down your, has suppressed your immune system. And so whatever lurking illness you previously had then manifests. So when people are in a state of fear, you are triggering, you are constantly triggering that immune system shut down and it affects the way you think, the way you react, it affects even your biological response to illness and you tend to fall sick in that state. So I tell people whatever you're doing, it's normal to fear but what you can do is to control your response to that fear and as long as you are able to remind yourself that what you're fearing is more what you're thinking than what is happening once you can ch channel that thought process in the direction of hope then you find that your body responds very differently well a hopeful way of thinking or a hopeful way of responding right now is one take precaution you have to take all the necessary precaution we, we are not careless individuals, we need to take all the necessary precaution. But at the same time, you need to also keep your mind occupied with the future and tell yourself, as of today, for example, you bury your mind in the present first and tell yourself, as of today, is there anything I need today that I don't have? Need. And as long as the answer to that is no, everything I need right now, I have. You bury your mind on that and ask yourself, do I have what I need for tomorrow? Not everybody, unfortunately, can tell themselves honestly that they have everything they need for tomorrow. But for those that can, you need to remind yourself, this is not the first issue you're having in your life. And this is not the first time you're thinking this issue will bury you. But if you're still here, clearly all the past issues didn't. And you must remind yourself that as human beings, we're resilient, we survive based on how we plan after every circumstance that's aggressive to our existence and so we just need to keep reminding ourselves be cautious take all precaution 
but continue to plan as if when we're out of this, life continues. So as a result of this pandemic, there's a lot of social the changes to social interactions, which I will not say were caused by the pandemic. I will say they already existed and the pandemic triggered their use. So for example, uh, virtual meetings is now a thing. It's always been there, but it is now almost the norm. And my concern in this period is that as social beings, we have a need, a desire, we thrive in having social interactions, not just digital interactions, but also physical interactions. This pandemic has created a mind shift in that area where people will see less and less of a reason to have physical interaction. And for me, that is a major concern because as you know, sometimes a lot of people, a lot of us, find ourselves in one type of distress or the other. And without even saying anything, a close friend gives you a hug. Without saying anything, after a minute or two, you start to feel better. Um, you meet somebody, you have a handshake, it's a warm handshake. There is something about that physical interaction that boosts the energy around human beings. And this pandemic has cut to the core of that, where we're all okay doing Zoom calls, we're all okay having FaceTime, we're all okay sending messages. Having Those are part of our evolution, there's no doubt. But this has now put a rift we, where we even have to quote and unquote measure the distance we keep from each other. So the technology that has been building up to this, for example, self-driving cars, you are going, I would expect that in the near future, the interests in the technology that enhances <laughs> less of human physical interaction will boom. As much as that sounds like a business opportunity, it sounds like where we're headed, for me personally, understanding how the human spirit requires that physical bonding, it's, for me, it's, it's a worry. And that is the future that will unfold in a future where our perception of the need for physical interaction reduces. For us to be able to bridge that near inevitable gap, is to consciously remind ourselves that this distancing is for a very specific purpose. It's the purpose to flatten the curve on the pandemic. So we reduce the spread, depending when we get the vaccinations or the medication for it. But we need to understand that subsequently, we need to go back to what human beings do, and that is interact socially and physically. We need to have that at the back of our mind. This is like being in ICU. Do not make ICU your lifestyle. We're doing this for a specific time, for a specific purpose. It should not become our lifestyle. We should go back to our lifestyle of holding each other, supporting each other, calling each other, hugging each other. That is what the human spirit requires to survive efficiently. Well, opportunities, as for opportunities, I like talking about the opportunities, especially in times like this, because everybody is focused on the immediate. But there's something very significant that we need to realize from this pandemic. And I would need to take us back just a little bit to where 2014, especially for us here in Nigeria and Africa as, as a whole, 2014 was the horrible Ebola outbreak. And if you look at like me, I like to look at things from a systems perspective. I try to ignore the symptoms and look at the underlying systems on which everything is happening. In 2014, Ebola was a horrible illness that was taking a lot of lives. And at that time, what I believed was that what was being tested was our ability to rally around in unity to fight a common enemy by building the systems that give us the weapon to fight that enemy. In that instance, the system was the healthcare system. In 2014, in my opinion, we did overcome Ebola, and as far as I am concerned personally, because Dr. Stella Adadevo sacrificed her life to prevent that issue from being an outbreak or an epidemic. She sacrificed her life, she gave her life for this. And somehow, with the work of Lagos State, obviously, we were able to manage and overcome that issue. 
but we did it as an individual issue. We did not subsequently do anything substantial regarding reinforcing, reestablishing, strengthening the system on which we need to fight illness, which is the healthcare system. Our spending, if you look at our budget allocation to the healthcare sector, it's abysmally low. It cannot do anything. We have 774 local governments in the country. On paper, we have 30 or 40,000 healthcare centers, primary healthcare centers on paper. In reality, they don't exist. And so without addressing the healthcare system, and healthcare system is not about buildings, it's about the infrastructure that we need, infrastructure being the human capital, the doctors, the nurses, the beds, as we're being exposed now globally, ventilators, access to oxygen, medication, uh, pharmaceutical companies, the entire ecosystem of the healthcare sector needs to be revamped, re-established in such a way that the whole nation will benefit. Something else that this pandemic has brought out, which I like, I apologize to those who will offend, but I love it, is that like Ebola, Ebola was no respecter of persons. It didn't respect your status. It did not matter how much money you had. If you got it, if you were going to die, you died. This pandemic now, has done the same thing. No respecter of persons. Now, those people, in the past, people went out and said, let us, and when I refer to us, if you're watching, us, the elite that can afford TVs and DSTVs, we are the elite. Let us do something about helping the less privileged and the vulnerable by providing systems that make them work. A lot of us think because we have healthcare insurance, we have visas, we can travel, it is not our problem. But guess what? This has exposed everybody. Nobody can travel, <laughs> nobody can move. The same healthcare system you refuse to assist is now where you have to go. And so this creates a massive opportunity for investment in the healthcare sector. It creates a massive opportunity for us to become aware that if we don't realize that we are all one, if you don't help the person that is down, on, like they say, you need to be kind to the people you meet on your way up because you may meet them on your way down. If we don't realize that the opportunity now is for us to create systems that support everybody, where whether you're a governor, whether you're the president, whether you're a local government chairman, create a system that you can use because once you can use it locally, then the vulnerable can use it as well. So that creates a system to improve the quality and the standard of life for everybody. This has opened our eyes and will create the opportunity for us to do something about it. As individuals, we all have a role to play. And some of us, not everybody can do everything. In fact, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And so for some of us, if you can't add value to the system, because not everybody will be able to do that, do not deplete from it. And so we say that oh, it's not left to the president or the vice president, or the ministers, or the governors, or the senators, or the legislators. Well, it's not left to just them. They take some of those decisions, but we need to understand our rights and responsibility to not beg for it, demand for it. We must continue demanding for it. And more importantly for me is that we must understand that we must continue to expect them to perform. Because generally, and this is what everybody must do, generally we don't have an expectation of performance. We think they will come, they will do nothing, they will go. So our expectation becomes our reality. We expect nothing, we get nothing, and so we don't complain. So each and every one of us has to raise our expectation. When you go to a healthcare center that's dilapidated or run down, get angry. And when that anger spreads, we're not going to be hailing the people that should have fixed it when they drive past. We'll be angry. They will sense our anger. Then they'll be moved to act. Because not all of us can contribute money. Not all of us can pick up the phone and call people to say, I saw this problem, let's fix it. Those of us that can, we must continue doing that. I have friends who are in politics. Every now and again, I will call them up and point out, you're not doing this. You're, this, is, this is what a lot of us elite ought to do. Keep holding them accountable, it is not just our right, it is our responsibility to make sure that they do their jobs and to stop expecting that they don't. As a country, this pandemic has exposed end to end our socioeconomic issues, 
our infrastructural issues, our quality of life issues. And it now gives us, as a country and as a continent, the means to say, if these are the end-to-end -end issues, how do we begin resolving them? And so this allows us to reset. It gives us a perfect reason to say, you know what, the whole world is resetting. This pandemic has given a lot of excuses for a lot of people to do a lot of things. Regarding money flow after this ends, um, there's something I always say, and it's very, it's slightly hilarious, but allow me a minute or two to explain it. And this is how I explain it. Pooping is the end product of eating. You want to poop properly, you eat well. You have your vegetables, you have your balanced diet. There's a way you eat, you have enough fluids. The end product of that is poop. Now, why am I talking about poop when I'm supposed to be talking about money? Money is poop. Money is the end product of a process of events that no matter what, at the end of which is money, you don't go to a sock away and take what is in it and keep it in your house. If you do that, it's going to bring you what? Sickness, disease, and death. It's the same thing with money. You don't accumulate money for the sake of keeping it. If you do that, it's going to bring you mental illness, mental disease, and mental death. It's the same relationship. What are the things we ought to do that no matter what happens, the end product is money? And those are the things that we need to concentrate on as a country, as individuals, as a country, as a continent. What do we do? What can we, what chain reaction can we initiate that no matter what, at the end of it, we're going to have money? And what happens when you start understanding that flow of money? You need to create a series of events whose outcome is money. Once you have the outcome, before you get the outcome, you have a plan for it. Immediately the money comes in, you deploy it. And so it becomes like liquid, it flows. Once liquid, like a gutter, once it stagnates, it gets infected. You have to make sure it continues flowing. So for individuals, for the country, for the continent, we have to find out individually, what is my process? Because my digestive system and yours are not the same thing. You may eat beans, some people are lactose intolerant, they eat, they drink milk, it doesn't work for them, it works for me. So everybody has to find out what is it that I can do naturally that whether or not I like it, the end product will bring me money and I already have a use for that money to channel it back to not to generate more money but to help humanity. Because in helping humanity, for argument's sake, the gods of money, <laughs> want people to be helped and if they see that you are willing to help humanity then they will visit you more so in terms of channeling money to the right areas in the new post-pandemic world for nigeria um, infrastructure is too broad a topic but i'm going to say a few things number one if we want the future of this country to be as bright as it ought to be then the f one of the first places we must start is the education sector. The education sector spits out everything we are. Your doctors, your lawyers, your politicians, your military, <laughs> your police officers, everything we are comes through the education sector. And so we need to then work it backwards and say, what do we need? Infrastructure, not schools. Let's not mistake school schooling with education. For education, the infrastructure we need are the teachers, the curriculum, the teaching aids, before we talk of the structure. What are we spending on teachers? What are we spending on curriculum? What are we spending on teaching aids? We need to invest heavily in that and we'll start to reap the benefits in the next generation. It's not going to be reaped immediately. Then we need to look at the health sector, obviously. What do we need? 60 to 70% of the ailments we suffer can be dealt with at the primary health level. We need to revamp that, spend on that, and then move to secondary and tertiary. Number three, we need to revamp the, we need to ensure that rule of law is paramount. For a demo, if we practice a democracy, we need rule of law to be paramount. Rule of law is saying that no matter who you are, you are subject to the same law as everybody else. 
For us to do that, the law enforcement system has to be revamped. The judiciary has to be revamped. So when you look at Nigeria as a system with many subsystems, to bring Nigeria back to life, we need to focus on the subsystems, give them back their purpose. The life of a man lies in his blood. The life of a system lies in its purpose. What is the purpose of the educational sector? I went to uh, federal government college. The minister's son was on this side. A farmer's son was on this side. We were all friends. We need to bring that back to give everybody equal opportunity to learn and grow. The educational sector, the healthcare sector, the law enforcement sector, the judiciary sector, the legislative sector, all those, we need to invest a lot in them. We need to prioritize, invest in those. Do we need roads and power? Yes, we do. We will then need to separate which one, which of these sectors should the private sector, or rather which of these systems should the private sector be handed to deal with and which one should be a social amenity for the government to deal with it. So we need that robust plan to sit down and then we would be able to attract the money into those specific areas because we would have a short, a medium and a long term plan for the utilization. Okay, in talking about innovation, um, Innovation is something I, I like talking about, it's, but it's going to be very hard to collectively accept innovation without a proper education sector. Because what is education? Education, in my opinion, and very simply put, education gives you the ability to think and ask questions. So education gives you the ability to think and ask questions for the purpose of solving problems. So, and that's what innovation is, solving problems. And the key thing about innovation is, more often than not, innovation is what has never been done before. But if you're in a society that's a copycat society, then you're going to find it really hard to innovate because everybody wants to do what everybody else has done. So, and everybody cannot innovate. A few people need to be given the space and the authority to innovate. And you have to make sure that these are educated people. You do not, <laughs> emphasis on do not, want to give innovation to people that are not educated, people that cannot think, people that cannot ask appropriate questions. You do not want to give innovation to politicians. You must give innovation to people that are tested over time with the right educational qualities that can think through things, understand the ramifications of their decisions, and be willing to take the consequences of those actions. That's what innovation is. And this, op this gives us an opportunity to internalize and say, okay, as a country or as a nation, what can we do that nobody else is doing? What do we have that nobody, what is our competitive advantage? People say, oh, we have a large population, so we have a large labor force. It's not true. We have a large number of people able to work, but your labor force to be efficient has to be educated. We don't have a large number of properly educated people. So no matter what it is, no matter what problem, there is hardly anything I can speak about that will not take us back to fixing the educational system. That's terribly, terribly broken. And I'm not talking about schooling, education. Education, like I said, is about asking questions. Do we have a culture of asking questions? We do not. You ask some people questions, they tell you I'm constituted authority, do not ask me questions. Some of our cultures do not allow you question elders. If you can't question elders, how do you glean or learn their wisdom? We need to teach people how to ask questions because again, there's a generation coming that has no idea how to interact. They don't know how to ask questions. So they are seen as rude and insolent, largely true. So you need to teach people how to extract information teach people how to pass information, and that's how education gets formed, not always in the classroom. So for us to innovate, we need to be able to extract a few people who we see pass the education test. Give them a say, okay, you guys, take a room, think about this, come up with stuff we can do, show us how to implement it, and that's why governments have private sector collaborations, they have advisors, they have consult, they have different groups of people outside government and outside politics to do that. We need to start implementing things like that to be able to pull as much of the resource, the scarce resources we have together. So if I was to paint a picture of the Nigeria I want to see post this pandemic, it would be a Nigeria where we would have 
a 20 to 40, a 20 to 50 year plan that says we have isolated the critical sectors or the critical systems within the country that form the foundation for us to build the nation we want. And those sectors or systems are a healthcare, education, law enforcement, judiciary, the legislation. And when people realize that the law enforcement is doing the job of enforcing law and order, irrespective of status, and the judiciary, as their symbol is, is blind to who you are, it will dispense justice. Once You have to achieve that before you start any other fight on curbing what we call wastage or corruption. So those are the things I would like to see. Then we can see, okay, then we have a vision and see in five years, this is what we'll see. Because once you do that, and you can show people, we promised you X in one year, and then in one year, we see it. Then you infuse the nation with hope. Then in two years, they see what you promised. When you tell them this is what it will be in 10 years, then the whole nation, the mindset changes from looking behind and longing for the good old days to looking to the future to see a better future. And that is what we need to, that's what I would like to see the country move towards. <music>